Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm Tiffany Roberts from the Ledger Analyst Office, and today I've been asked to um, provide some background to you today on AB 32, as well as to discuss program design um, to provide a backdrop for today's discussion. Um, AB 32, as you mentioned, was passed in 2006 and established the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. Among other provisions, the legislation directed ARB to develop a plan which would encompass a set of regulations and programs that taken together um, would be a pathway forward in meeting the 2020 greenhouse gas emission reduction target. Um, that plan is commonly referred to as the AB 32 scoping plan, and ARB included a cap and trade program as part of the AB 32 scoping plan. Um, let me just briefly cover how the cap and trade program works and cover the, the concept of the cap. Um, ARB um, included um, what's known as a cap, and this cap um, basically um, sets a limit on aggregate emissions, and that limit declines over time, ultimately arriving at the target emissions level. Um, the, in order to operationalize the cap, the regulator, or ARB in this instance, administering the program creates allowances equal to the numeric value of the cap. So, for example, if the cap is um, 100 million tons of carbon dioxide, then the regulator would create 100 million allowances. Um, the regulator then requires large emitters to obtain allowances equal to their emissions in a given period of time. And because the cap declines and allowances become more scarce over time, allowance prices likely increase, which in turn creates a greater incentive for those entities who are subject to the cap and trade program to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as such, it's the supply and demand for allowances coupled with that scarcity created by the declining cap that forces the achievement of the environmental goal. Now, as part of um, the AB 32 scoping plan, ARB adopted the cap and trade regulation that places a cap on roughly 85 percent of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. And while each covered entity is not assigned an individual target, if they emit at least 25,000 tons or more of carbon dioxide equivalent on an annual basis, they are subject to the cap and trade regulation and therefore are considered to be a covered entity. Um, when the program is fully operational, which will be in January of 2015, um, approximately 650 of the state's largest emitters will be subject to the cap and trade program. That includes oil producers, refiners, electricity generators, um, large manufacturing, et cetera. And in order to comply with the regulation, a covered entity has to obtain one allowance for every ton of emissions that it emits in a given period of time. Under ARB's cap and trade programs, program covered entities have an opportunity to obtain allowances in multiple ways. Um, the program is designed to provide a portion of the allowances for free while another portion are available for purchase at quarterly auctions. Covered entities also have the opportunity to buy and sell those allowances then on the open market. And over time, the cap on aggregate emissions is scheduled to decline from just over 400 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent down to 341 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And as I mentioned, um, as the cap declines, the number of allowances ARB makes available will dec decline proportionally. Um, thus, covered entities are going to have to determine if it's more cost effective for them to buy allowances at ever-increasing prices or if it's more cost effective for them to go and make upgrades to their facilities, such as energy efficiency upgrades. Now, I'll also talk a bit about the concept of a backstop and how cap and trade serves as the backstop to everything else in the AB 32 scoping plan. The way ARB has set up the program, um, cap and trade serves as the backstop to everything else in the scoping plan in order to ensure that the state achieves its greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Um, it does this by capturing 
any underperformance of other measures. In other words, if the scoping plan measure were to miss its greenhouse gas emission reduction target, those additional emissions that weren't reduced by that measure would show up in the emissions reporting that's required to the Air Board on a regular basis. In turn, those additional emissions would have to be covered by cap and trade allowances. Thus, cap and trade would capture those missed emission reductions. So for illustrative purposes, let's uh, think about an example from the electricity sector. The state's energy efficiency programs, which are included as part of the scoping plan, are supposed to reduce electricity consumption and thus greenhouse gas emissions. If, however, the energy efficiency programs, for example, were not to reduce energy consumption and they missed their planned targets, electricity generators would continue to produce electricity at the same level and in turn would have to then purchase additional allowances to meet that additional cap and trade obligation. Therefore, if other scoping plan measures don't achieve their greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, those emissions are then picked up by the cap and trade program. So that basically um, is a synopsis then of how the program works and how it's designed to work. I'm 